Yes, sir. I was sent as part of a joint task force engineering team, and my role on that team was a subject matter expert for humanitarian aid and disaster response activities. I had three primary missions, if you will, while I was there. One was working with a State Department a recovery team to recover human remains of American citizens who were killed in the earthquake. Uh, they needed a structural engineer to go with the mortuary affairs people to safely recover the bodies. Uh, the biggest single effort I did, though, was the uh, damage assessment teams. They called them habitability assessment teams. Uh, the goal there was, you know, there were over a million displaced people. Uh, if we could get even a fraction of those back into their homes, that was a huge uh, uh, elimination of uh, stress on the system there. So that was a, the biggest single part of my responsibility there. And then finally I worked with the, um, the displaced person camps to try to make them more safe in terms of their uh, runoff of uh, water, heavy rains, things like that. So improving the drainage from those facilities, making it more safe. Yeah, Haiti was kind of a perfect storm for disasters, if you will, earthquake-related disasters. The, the city itself is in an alluvial basin, so very soft soils, so you tend to amplify ground motions in those kinds of conditions. And then because the country, uh, their heating and cooking is based on charcoal, they've basically denuded their landscape. So they have lots of landslide issues, things like that. So you, you kind of take this worse condition f geographically, and then on top of that, you add construction that really had no basis in design codes as we know them here in the U.S. So you had very fragile structures. Uh, there are also no inspections, uh, things like that. So even things where maybe there was some design put into them, they were seldom constructed based on any real design effort. So it was really the worst possible situation. Yeah, I, I did spend about a month in New Orleans after Katrina as part of a, an urban search and rescue team. Um, you know, U.S., our codes are pretty robust. Our structures are, are very well designed. In the U.S., more of the issues tend to be related to uh, individuals maybe not being able to get out of their homes or out of their places of work uh, because of, uh, you know, disabilities in one form or another. Uh, there in Haiti, uh, it just literally was a shambles. Uh, we, in fact, as part of the assessment teams, we couldn't bring ourselves to rate any structure as safe. So we finally had to come to a decision that we would say they were no worse than they were prior to the earthquake. Uh, so that was, instead of what we would do here in the U.S., saying they're safe for occupancy, there we could only really say it's no worse than it was before the earthquake. Um, so very totally different standards. Uh, I also, after like Loma Prieta earthquake, which occurred in the early 89, 90 time frame in San Francisco, did a lot of work with Caltrans on infrastructure following that earthquake. And, you know, in general, even though our infrastructure definitely has problems, it's aging, a lot of our structures are actually beyond their design service lives. Mm -hmm they were still all designed with fairly robust uh, code criteria. So uh, we definitely have our problems. There's things we need to do, but we're still far better off than, than most places I've seen. Because there is literally no other place that, that you can work. I, and I worked in public sector or private sector most of my life. Mm -hmm. I worked for... She's nearly 30 years in the private sector before I joined the federal government. And I never had the opportunities there that, that I've had in the last five years in the federal government. Uh, you get to do things that, that literally not only impact individuals, but you can impact policy. You can impact the direction uh, of future code criteria, things like that. So it's a very powerful opportunity as an engineer to work in federal service. Originally, you know, I, I wanted to be able to stamp drawings. I wanted to take responsibility for my work. So that was the original motivation mm -hmm. in getting my license. Um, as it has turned out, 
and I certainly didn't plan any of this, but without the license, I would have never been able to get on. Uh, FEMA has what they call urban search and rescue teams, mm -hmm. and you can't be an engineer on one of those teams without a license. So the fact that I had a license, I was able to become part of an urban search and rescue team. Being part of that team was instrumental in the job I'm now with the Navy, working for emergency management. And that allowed me to go to Haiti, which was a life-changing experience for me. One, the most wonderful thing I've ever had the opportunity to participate in. So, you know, it's, it's one of those domino effects. I think our problem is continuing to get the best talent. Um, Admiral Mossy earlier today mentioned problem solvers, and that's what I also agree. That's what we engineers are, problem solvers. And you and I talked earlier, we get physically excited by being presented with a problem. Right. And, and, you know, the difficulty is in our current culture attracting young people with those talents. Uh, you know, they. There are no TV shows about engineers. There's nothing, uh, you know, glorious about engineering. So the fact that NSPE does this award is, to me, a big deal. I think it highlights the fact that we engineers, although we're quiet and essentially invisible in society, and, and we want it to be that way. We want people to implicitly trust our structures. We, we don't want them to be really thinking about what we do. But somehow we need to raise that awareness. So, again, I'm grateful for what NSP is doing with this award. So, Hopefully more people will be aware of, of what engineers are doing and how we're contributing.